Good morning and welcome to Deep South Dining, where on this day in 1969, the Archies had a number one hit entitled Sugar Sugar. You remember it, Carol? I remember it well. It's a classic and it's a good thing it's Sugar Sugar Day because we're going to be talking about pies. We're going to be talking pies, pies, and pies. How you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm well. I'm well. It's, it's sort of fallish. Sort of. Sort of. We're headed into uh, September, October, football season, uh, fall festivals, fall vegetables. Halloween. And what on earth is this in our centerpiece? This is a show and tell show that we just decided to uh, uh, to adopt. And Carol brought a squash, and it's amazing. It is an amazing squash, and this squash was gifted to me by Neil Strickland of. Raymond, Mississippi, who mm-hmm. is a wonderful grower, farmer, interesting person, and uh, it a is renaissance a renaissance man. He is a renaissance man. <laughs> he, he indeed, and his wife, Janie, is a renaissance woman. But True. this is a Dutch crookneck squash. It weighs about 10 pounds. And I think it kind of looks like a horse collar. Horse collar. It's as big as a spare tire. It is as big as a spare and it's, tire. And it takes up most of the space between where I sit and where you sit. Yes, and uh, you and Java both modeled it. Modeled it around your neck, and then Java <laughs> pumped some squash with. Yeah, yeah did his, his so maybe bi- you can share curls. Maybe you can share the squash photograph on our website so that we can help our listeners to visualize, to visualize of this, what we speak to visualize but um it is coming into winter squash season it's mm-hmm. you know that's where we're we're going and i was just i would say i was flabbergasted by this squash yeah it it, it is uh, quite a sight to see it is quite a sight to see but uh you know i looked i looked on google and i put <laughs> In my search engine, I put squash that looks like a horse collar. That and did not yield any results. No results. But I finally got there, and it's very popular among the Amish. Of course, you know, mm-hmm. many of them are from of Dutch origin, and gotcha. they make squash butters, squash everything, roast it, boil it. I'm gotcha. sure maybe somewhere there's even a festival for it. How about a squash pie? Could be a squash pie. We make tomato pies. Why couldn't we make a squash pie? We certainly could make a squash pie. But anyway, it's a very thin skin squash, so you can cook it with the skin on or or peel it. And it's the color of butternut squash. Mm -hmm. Make a great soup. It does. In fact, there was a recipe for uh, Dutch crook neck squash soup. So there you go. Show and tell. Wow. I want to hear stories of other people's. You know, I love a giant squash or a giant pumpkin story. It's like going to the fair, and as Java pointed out, it's like, you know, the the blue ribbon squash grown by Mrs. Smith. Yes, her, Mr. Strickland from Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you've cooked one of these before. I have. I've, I, I did. It, this is enough squash. We could pass it around. I actually thought about passing it around the Jackson area members of our cooking and coping face. Oh, we could get all 4,000 of them yeah, a slice. <laughs> everybody, everybody could uh, have a little piece of squash here, and I certainly want to leave you with a chunk. It, well, good, good. It's it's great. I'm glad you brought it in, and, and for our listeners, if you're more curious than we have shared, <laughs> feel free to search and uh, give us a call if you've dealt what, with this squash before. What's in your garden, and what have you been cooking? Me, my garden is bare. Uh, I've pretty much taken everything. I've got a few egg plant plants left, but I have not planted any winter uh, yet. I want to plant some uh, lettuce and some kale and some winter stuff, but I have not done it yet. I have tilled my small garden space, and zinnias popped up everywhere because I'm always throwing zinnia zinnia seed, seeds yeah. into the ground. Mine are just, just gorgeous. It, it you know, it's the last gasp of summer, but mm. mine are just gorgeous right now. Hey, you know what else today is? Uh, Monday. 
according to Java, it is National <laughs> Cheeseburger Day. Oh. Well, actually, I I didn't want to leave it out, but National Cheeseburger Day was uh, Saturday. Oh, was okay. Saturday. Yeah, and uh, we just had to talk about it because, you know, cheeseburgers are just one of those things where you, you really just can't live without it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so good that people who don't eat meat try to create cheeseburgers, you know. Yes, they do. And, and, and there's even patties. a song, Cheeseburgers in Paradise. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> yeah, and, and Mal, at Helen Mal's, they have a cheeseburger, but it's a cheeseburger and pair of dice. As in the casino world. Okay, I was about to say, what is that? Is that yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy being sleazy. <laughs> <laughs> but today is actually National Rum Punch Day. So if I could reach across the table, I'd punch you, Carol, yeah. on the shoulder. And I wish I could reach down to uh, Hope Town in the Bahamas where my brother Ben, who is barefoot probably driving a tractor this morning has mm. made many a rum punch it's his specialty on and oh. on that island they call it pucket punch wow you know speaking of cheeseburgers the uh, oldest fast food restaurant in the world is white castle the franchise white castle which opened in 1921 wow yeah there you go uh, and uh, speaking of burgers, I've recently seen a lot of ads, which are annoying, by a large fast food franchise, which is obviously spending millions, promoting a grilled cheeseburger, which is basically a patty melt. And they posed the question, what came first, the grilled cheese or the burger? You, you look like you've not seen this. Oh, so, I, ha- good for I you. haven't <laughs> seen it, but the, just the thought of it just makes me crazy. Java, have you seen that said ad? I ha- I have seen it, and it is just what you just said, a patty melt, yeah. and you know, mar- as they say, marketing. Now, do you <laughs> consider a patty melt a cheeseburger, Java? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I mean, because I like the Texas toast, you mm-hmm. know, I, I I do like that. I, I guess I was. I don't. Yes, I was. Okay, say it's a cheeseburger. Carol. Uh, no, 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 different animal. No, okay. no, no, okay. no, no. But um. Yeah, Java, you said something that just hit me a couple of minutes ago. You were saying that people, you know, like a cheeseburger may not be something you eat regularly, but people care deeply about their cheeseburgers. And when they want a cheeseburger, they usually have something or somewhere in mind. Right. Yeah, and I was just about to say, I I, I, I literally just thought about this, because one of the best cheeseburgers I had was in Memphis at a place called Ernestine and Hazel. Um, and they had what they called the Soul Burger, mm-hmm. and it's a, um, a famous uh, uh, juke joint, I guess you could call it. And um, I remember we met the owner. Me and my wife went down there one uh, one time. Uh, but that was just it just popped in my head. So yeah, we have we, Stamps Burgers here in Jackson. Yeah, and that's a classic, very classic. classic. I met part of the family the other day. They were having lunch at Howlin' Mouse, and we sat down and talked about the, the restaurant biz and the pandemic. It was really interesting. I love a, 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 one of their burgers. Stamps. Well, you know, a few years ago, I did an article for Delta Magazine uh, on best burgers, and I can't even remember how long ago it's been, but my best burger was the Blue Rooster in Flora. Oh, yeah, which we we passed by the other yeah. day. But we, we need to... Uh, yeah, we really need to go, go back and, and, and take Java. But, you know, what's so great about their burgers is they give you a long list and you literally create your own burger. So uh-huh. it is a cheeseburger in paradise because you can pick from many different kinds of cheeses and condiment. It is the true have it your way. You well, can you know, hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Yeah, right. Well, I love a, a burger. Now, both of you are probably going to be taken aback by this, but I don't like ch- cheeseburgers. I don't want cheese on my burger. I want a burger. I want a hamburger. Well, what is a hamburger without cheese? It's a hamburger. <laughs> With cheese, it's a cheeseburger. <laughs> I, I don't. I like cheese, and I love hamburgers, but I don't particularly like the two of them combined. It's weird. I know you're you're speechless. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm glad you said it because it, that is weird. That is weird. Yeah, I, there I, you go. And every time I order a hamburger in a restaurant, they'll say, "What kind of cheese do you want it?" And I say, "I didn't order a cheeseburger. I just asked for a hamburger dressed, onions, pickles, tomato, lettuce, 
mustard on the side. And if I wanted a cheeseburger. You would have ordered one. <laughs> wow. But, you know, a couple of my other favorite uh, burger places in Jackson, I love the burger at Barrel House. Have, has, have any of you had that? I've not had the Barrel House burger. It's, it's excellent. Uh, it's got caramelized onion, which I mm-hmm. really like on a burger. And, yeah, you know, they have a special sauce. Well, they should. I love a good special. We, you and I, never met a condiment. We didn't. We like. did not like. And speaking of of condiments, one of my other favorites, and and you know, I don't really eat much meat. So when I when I do a che- a burger or a cheeseburger, I mean, I'm going all out. The Baba Burger, the uh, Baba Babalu, and the thing that it has on it that makes it, you know, really. Good. It has some avocado. I know you might freak out about that. Not but, interested. Oh, wait. But wait. <laughs> so don't turn away from but the wait. avocado. They have, well, I love avocados. But. They have a chipotle aioli on the burger, and it, it just gives it a really nice kick. One, one sort of side, aside on burgers that I like. You never see, You talk about old school. Now, this is old school. If you order a hamburger at the Mayflower, when it comes out, it's it's the bun is opened up, the meat, the onions, the pickle, lettuce, tomatoes on one side, and then the open bun is on the other, and they put half mayonnaise and half mustard on the open side. Like in an X, like or no, like half divided half. down the so line. So it's half yellow and half white. Cool. Old school. Cool. cool just school. just a tidbit. Just okay. a tidbit. Well, we do have a caller on the line. I want to join our uh, burger conversation, and it's uh, uh, Tim Tim in Gulfport. Uh, good morning, Tim. Hey, Tim. Yes. What's yeah. going on, buddy? Say again. I said, "What's going on?" Thanks for calling. Oh yeah, uh, wanted to talk to you about the origin of the hamburger. Please do. Uh, it came obviously from Hamburg, Germany. Correcto. Uh, in, in the 1700s, Russian sailors used to come into the port of Hamburg, and they would get the specialty in Hamburg, which was a form of steak tartar. Oh. They absolutely loved it, but they couldn't obviously couldn't take it on the ship back to Russia. So someone on the sh- on one of their ships got the bright idea of cooking it. To and preserve as a result, it. we got the hamburger. You and heard by the it way, here. My, on my hamburgers, all I have is onion. I don't have any condiments, no cheese, nothing, just raw onions. Perfect. Traditional. That is so interesting about, I mean, I knew it came from uh, Hamburg, Germany, Hamburg, Germany, but had no idea. What a great story. I mean, I guess we're not surprised the Russians were involved. Well, because they, their oh, food yeah. was so bad. I mean, I'm sure that they were just thrilled with the very idea of the hamburger and you know, not having borscht for dinner. <laughs> well, well t- we get the hot dog from Frankfurt, Germany, the Frankfurter, and so why not the hamburger from Hamburg? Why not? And you know, Tim, it would be a great show to do a hot dog show. Ooh, I love a, I love a hot dog. Make a note, John. Yeah, well, the same, I do the same thing with hot dogs. I just put onions on them. I don't put anything else. You are a purist, my friend. I'm a, I'm a carnivore. Yeah, well, we appreciate you, and thank you so much for calling. <laughs> hey, Tim, you got nope, a favorite? Nope. You got a favorite hamburger on the Mississippi Gulf Coast? You're from Gulfport. Uh, I, I, since I live on the coast, I tend to eat a lot of seafood. Yeah. I rarely eat a hamburger. You cook your own when you eat them. Yeah, I cook my own occasionally, uh, but uh, like I said, it's primarily seafood around here. And most of the time, if I'm going to put something on a bun, it's going to be a crab cake. Oh, oh. now we're talking. <laughs> I yeah. love a crab cake. A little more expensive than a hamburger, but a lot better. Who far cares far. how much it costs? I'll pay $20 yeah. for a good crab cake sandwich. Yeah, they're, uh, that's about what a pound of crab meat costs right now. I understand. Tim, thank you so All much right. for listening, and we very much appreciate your calling and right, the info bye-bye. on the origin of the hamburger. I'm getting text messages over here, Tim. Oh boy! I don't, I don't, this, that un, only onion on the hamburger. I had people text me and just say, "Come on, man, <laughs> got to have a little bit more than now." Onion. I will, I love only onion and mustard as as a 
sort of a deviation from the typical dress. I, I have no problem with— I like caramelized onion. I do, too, but I also have no problem with a slice of raw onion and some mustard. Now, I will say I don't, I'm not a big, uh, I guess, onion eater, but I will put it on my burger, though. I Java, I love it that, that the text messages are coming in. Yeah, they, they, they say somebody give uh, Tim a mint <laughs> after, <laughs> after eating the burger. And you, you got to wear what you eat, you know, and sometimes when you go with onions and garlic, it, it is just what it is. I, is I hope we have some callers that tell us great hamburger places yeah. around the state. In fact, according to the script, it is now time for our first break, Carol. And when we come back, we're going to talk about your favorite cheeseburger or regular burger. Do you have a favorite local hamburger joint? Or do you have a recipe or a way that you like to cook it? And don't forget, we're going to be talking about pies here a little bit yeah, later on. Yeah, let's get through the burgers and let's then and get to those pies. And then we're going to touch a little bit on the proper pantry and preparing for hurricanes and disasters. We hope that uh, we can cover all three of those topics. Stay Either way, tuned. Stay tuned, and we'll be back. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. You're tuned to Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. Malcolm White with Carol Puckett. Hello, Carol. Hey, Mal. That was a great first segment talking about burgers. And we segued from squash to burgers. Seamlessly. Just like seamlessly. Just like that. I bet some people would do a squash burger as a veggie burger. Perhaps. That would not be me, but uh, it, it sounds good. So if you've ever prepared squash and put it on a burger, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, anyway, all right, so Todd's on the phone? Yeah, now we do have a caller. Um, Todd, you're on, you're, you're, on, you're on the air. What's going on, man? Uh, everything's great today. Just uh, hauling a load of logs. <laughs> all right, a logger. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, uh, my comment was uh, my favorite place in, that I can even think of for a hamburger is an old place in Jackson, Beatty Street Grocery. Beatty Street. Absolutely. Going yeah. strong after many, many years. The old and Beatty lots Street. Of grease. It is, uh, I, I've not eaten there in years because I'm working a little bit out away from there. But, uh, man, that is a fantastic burger. Uh, and I, I don't think they even open uh, until lunch. That's right. You know? <clears throat> yeah. But yeah. anyway, I just wanted to uh, call, and uh, I love the show. Everything's great, and uh, I'm listening to it every day, hauling logs. Hey, hey, wh- where are you hauling these logs, Todd? What part of the state are you in? Okay, I'm uh, right at Rankin County and Leak County line Leak. off of 25 Highway, ah. and I'm hauling them to uh, either Newton to the chip mill, yep. or either I'm going to Redwood, Mississippi, in Vicksburg. Wow, are, are yeah. you are you hauling it, uh, pupwood, uh, pine, or log switch? Well, if I go to uh, Redwood in Vicksburg, I haul pupwood, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I'll haul hardwood and pine. Or if I'm going to the chip mill in Newton, what I'll do is just take. Uh, uh, just chip mill logs. Right. Yeah. Well, well, thanks so much for listening, and we appreciate you calling and in. And stay safe out there with those logs. Absolutely. Beatty Street Absolutely. Grocery, uh, a great Jackson iconic uh, eatery, um, sort of in it's the on downtown. Beatty Street. On Beatty Street, sort of downtown. Off uh, of South, South State yep, Street, yep, yep, come yep. up back in there. I've eaten a hundred of them, mm-hmm. and, and they're terrific. I mean, a lot of things, this may not be something you know, Java, back in... <clears throat> A period in my life in my 20s, I was a logger, too. And I used to uh, drive a log truck and work no. out in the woods and cut down trees. And uh, I, I ran a skitter. And uh, What a varied career you've had. It's an interesting have you life. not done? <laughs> oh, lots. But, but I, I'm fascinated by the, the timber industry and the, and the logging culture. My next-door neighbor, uh, as a child, who was like an uncle, they were like family to me. They were loggers. So I spent a lot of time around them and— uh, 
learned a good bit about it and then got to do it for a while there. But anyway, the Beatty Street. Um, well, Carol, let's talk about pies. You, you Malcolm, know, you know a lot about it. pies. Well, I know a lot about them because I have eaten a lot of them. Same here. You know, I remember some years ago when Mockingbird Bakery was open in Greenwood, and you would call me mm. when I was working at the Alluvian and biking, and you'd say, are you coming home on Friday? Would you bring me a <laughs> lemon ice box pie from Mockingbird? Made by Martha Foos. Yes, and Martha Foos. Foose not only makes some of the best pies, but she, to me, is the queen of pie crust. And Amazing. You know, pie crust is, you know, it's a religious experience. I mean, having a good pie crust and making a good pie crust. But let's, let's kind of go back to the beginning of when pies were first written. About. The Russians, right? <laughs> no, it was... <laughs> Actually, the Greeks and the Romans ah. were doing, you know, doing all sorts of food, you know, wrapped in pastry. Right. Yeah, you know, mostly, mostly savory. Um, and the English have a big pie tradition and hand pie uh, tradition. But we know that you know, it was brought to the New World in the 17th century that the Puritans were making mincemeat pies and pumpkin pies. Hmm. And then down in Virginia, the early settlers were, you know, using fruit like apples and peaches and plums and and sweet potatoes. Oh. Well, um, now I love a fruit pie. Yeah, you do. Yes. Um, do you have a favorite? We, we spoke earlier about the apple pie being sort of the iconic American Pie. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because it is indeed an iconic, you know, God, mother, country, and apple pie. Mm-hmm. That was what our soldiers said they were fighting for during during the World War. I guess World War One was where it started. But apple pie is, you know, an of English origin. I mean, apples were not even native well, to. So are we, yeah. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not completely, but. Yeah, well, and, and I'm talking also, about you and I. Yeah, so we, you know, we, we're kind of <laughs> sort of, you know, we brought over the apple pie, but also, you know, the spices are in apple pie, you know, nutmeg <clears> and <throat> right. cinnamon. I mean, those are from like Sri Lanka and, and Indonesia. But it quickly became a big American favorite because the first American cookbook in 1796 featured apple pie. Hmm. I love a cherry pie also, I don't mind saying, and well, a peach. It, I, I don't know. I, I, I would really, peach pie. I would be hard-pressed to name my favorite a fruit pie. You know, I love to make a cherry pie, and in fact, I just got two jars of cherry pie feel, filling from up in Traverse City, Michigan, mm-hmm. from a company called American Spoon. It's one of those fillings that I can't make myself. I mean, I, I you know, I've never yeah, taken yeah. time to learn how to pit cherries and to, you know, and to do all that. But it is, yeah, that's a delicious pie. All right, we're going to uh, shift ever so slightly from pies. Did we lose Tom? No. We're going to shift over uh, to Chef Tom Ramsey from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Tom now works in New Orleans, is a chef, and he's been doing hurricane relief work from Ida. Hey, Tom, what's happening, my man? Good morning, Malcolm. How are y'all? Hi, Tom. Hey, Carol. How are y'all doing today? Good. We're just talking about pies and burgers and really interested in to hear what you're doing down there in New Orleans. Well, I like pies and burgers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so down here right now, I'm just finishing up. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm sitting here at my, at my desk covered in paperwork, accounting for the, all the stuff we purchased for these guys but um we operated a man camp um which is you know a mobile city uh with a population larger than Issaquina county and we this was um aspland tree workers who are yeah yeah they're clearing the trees and the debris and and all that to make room for energy to come in and get the power back on. So 
Our man camp was in the parking lot of uh, Faubourg Brewery, the former Dixie Brewery. How convenient for you. I know. It was great. Uh, the original man camp was supposed to be in Hammond, um, but this was this was nice. It was just close enough to me to be close to my house and still not get to go to my house at night. I, I slept in a, in a camper every night. But we were there for about 16 days. Mm. And we fed um, 1,200 Aspland workers and then 600 or so um, just other folks, uh, security guards, um, management people, people from Entergy, people from the environmental companies, um, the, all the guys from Kelly Services who maintain the trailers and all that. And we fed a hot breakfast every morning at 5.30 a.m. And then a hot supper every evening at 6.30. And then we, uh, when we fed them their breakfast, we sent them off with, uh, you know, a, <clears throat> a big po' boy uh, mm. and uh, chips and an apple or some fruit and Something some candy lunch. bars and that kind of stuff and sent them out into the swamps. And <laughs> these poor guys had to go out. Rain or shine, oh. whether they were on the pavement or up to their chest in swamp water, and battle the heat and the mosquitoes and the snakes and the gators and the, you know, everything else, and clear these lines so that um, they get the power back on. And so our, our role in it was to make sure they were they were well fed. So for those of you who've just joined us, we're talking with Tom Ramsey out of New Orleans, a Vicksburg native. He and <clears throat> some of his uh, restaurant cohorts have have banded together to help feed uh, the emergency workers in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, and that's what he's sharing with us now. Tom, yeah. I'd like to know some of the things you're feeding. Obviously, it has to be <laughs> well, big big vats of things, but I'm sure if you were cooking, they were wonderful vats of things. So I, I'm happy to give you the menu, but I want to make sure everybody knows this was a you know, we were paid to do this. This was not volunteer work, and and what's important about that is that my entire crew that were feeding all these folks um, had been laid off because of Ida. And right. So we were able to get a contract so that I could hire the 18 cooks and porters and servers and pay them a really generous day wage so that it could replace the income they were missing from being you know out of work because of Ida and, uh, and a little bit more. Um, you know, we, we pay almost double the prevailing wage to get these things done so that we can attract, you know, top talent to come to come help cook. And um, to answer your question, Carol, the, the, my best friend on this whole job was a 30-gallon tilt skillet. Uh-huh. So, uh, we could fill that up twice and feed the entire crew. So we did a uh, shrimp etouffee one day. We did red beans and rice with andouille. We made a, uh, a really hearty chicken sausage stew that we served over mashed potatoes. We did uh, chicken and dumplings. We did uh, what else? We did jambalaya one night. And then on the final night, we do prime rib. <laughs> and that, that is a massive amount of beef. We, we cooked um, right at a quarter ton of, uh, of ribeye. Wow. Wow. So you did it in shifts? So to cook a quarter ton of ribeyes, you have to start around 7 in the morning. So we, um, because you got to cook it slow. And so we, we had um, two big double door uh, wolf convection ovens, and we would cook, you know, cook the roast in those and then move them over into a, a, a warming box that held them at 140 until supper time. Mm. <clears throat> so is the restaurant where you work uh, a Chafalaya, are y'all back open and how long will so you a close? Chafalaya is back the Chafalaya is back open, but I have uh been recruited by a new restaurant group to open a series of new restaurants in the French Quarter. Oh, okay. News. News flash. Yeah, it's exciting. It's called Bonds B O N apostrophe S and we're doing uh Louisiana interpretations of international street food. Whoa, that sounds exciting. How many stores? Yeah. Uh, we're going to start with one, and the plan is to open four over the next five years. And they'll be in a ring, 
kind of um, Decatur Street, Camp Street, and then um, you know, Rampart on the backside. Tom, are most of the New Orleans restaurants back open now, or are some trickling uh, in and out? Well, What's happening? It's it's pretty sad. We had a couple that had had gotten back open from COVID, and then not, Ida just was a death blow. Like mm. uh, Cavan is a good example, one of the LeBlanc Smith properties. Um, it was open, and they were doing fine, and then Ida came along, and that just that ended it. Right. So... Mm. You know, we're, we're it's just been we're a lot open. to contend with these past two years. It, <laughs> it, it's been a wild ride. Um, it, but with the, the the vaccine proof of vaccination mandate, that that's helped so much because now you're not fighting over, you know, do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? Um, and contrary to popular belief, the vaccine mandate is pretty widely popular yeah. among the locals. Um, they walk in the door excited to show you their vaccine card. Um, yeah, and that that's how it, how it should people feel safe about going out, well, going back out, safe. having fun, yeah. Sure, if you know that when you sit down, everybody serving you and everybody sitting around you has been vaccinated or has had a negative test within 72 hours, then it's a little more relaxing. You can You can enjoy your meal rather than worrying about the guy coughing next to you. Was this mandated uh, citywide or statewide, Tom? This was, this was a city mandate. Citywide, okay. Um, the state requested it and recommends it. The city just said if if we want to avoid a repeat of what Mardi Gras did, mm. then we've got to we yeah. got to put our foot. That's good. Now, Tom, I want to bring it back to pie. <laughs> We're headed back to the sweets. <laughs> okay, I have two questions for you. Uh, do you have any, any information on how Hubig's is doing? And also, second question is, what is your favorite pie? So on Hubig's, there's, it's fits and starts. You hear that it's, it's done and ready and coming back any day now. And then you hear that it's uh, been shelved again. So mm. I, I don't have any reliable intelligence on that. Okay, well, uh, get on that, would you? Because <laughs> I, we I'm we on. haven't we really haven't talked yet about fried pies, but we're going to in a few minutes. And you know that Cubics is a pie. you know a, an icon standard of, absolutely of fried pies. And I know I think they've been closed for eight or nine years because of a fire, but. I know they were supposed to come back in 2021. Well, if sure. anybody has information, now, let us know. I could have sworn when I was in New Iberia and Tom Massey and I went out and ate po' boys and gumbo that this little restaurant had Hubic pies on Good. the counter. It, yep. it may be. I, I, there, was some, there was some infighting over the, the branding. There was, I mean, it, it, it's, it's been a big mess. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't want to wade off into that. Right, right. Well, and what's your favorite pie? My favorite pie is pecan pie. Oh boy, so southern. He's You're from southern. He's Vicksburg. Vicksburg. <laughs> All right. Well, Tom, thanks so much uh, for calling and and listening and and giving us uh, the scoop on uh, the work that you and your buddies are doing in uh, Post Ida and uh, giving us a little update on New Orleans eateries. Well, it's certainly great to talk to y'all. And if I can give one plug, that's you go right ahead. Kitchen. Uh, if anybody wants to donate to these kind of relief efforts, you know, what we did was, was paid for by Entergy. I mean, we, we were compensated. Uh-huh. Where the volunteers come in is through World Central Kitchen. Absolutely. And yeah, we're big supporters of World Central Kitchen give, here. Give, 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 give to World Central Kitchen. They are a fantastic organization, and they don't feed just the linemen. When they're in town, anybody that walks up gets fed. Right. Okay, Tom Ramsey calling in from New Orleans, and we appreciate that update. Tom Vicksburg native, uh, longtime Jackson restaurant tour. Carol, we're going to take a break when we come back. Let's and do it. Let's talk more about pies. Let's we want to get it. into the yeah, hand yeah. pies and, uh, and fried pies. And fried pies. Java knows a little bit about those. But uh, stay tuned. Carol and I will be right back with more Deep South Dining. Hello. 
I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee only financial advising firm and co host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart devices podcasting platform. Welcome back to Deep South Dining. We're talking about pies and burgers and the proper pantry, which we may not have much time for. But we we got an email, Java, from one of our uh, cooking and coping uh, companions and padres. Can you report out on that? Yeah, Amanda um, Anglin, one of the cooking and coping um, uh, members, she was talking about her favorite local burger places uh, that we were talking about earlier. And she was saying that she likes burgers from... The Star Drive-In in Summit, or um, or she'll go to the Burger Basket in Osaka. And uh, when we started talking about the pies, of course, she said this time of year is great for sweet potato pie, but her favorite is the Mile High Lemon Meringue Pie. Mm-hmm. Those are... Yeah, I think you could sell a lot of people on that. I'll, I'll sign up for that Mile High Lemon Meringue Pie. Yeah, Thank I'm a you. I'm a lemon guy in, uh, uh, in our local baker here. In uh, at MPB, Kevin Farrell, who's uh, answering the phones this morning, he brought in some, uh, uh, I believe they're lemon squares. Correct. Yes. <laughs> we every Monday, Carol and Java and I are treated to Kevin's uh, handiwork. Yes, I think we should give him a theme the week before. Oh, it could okay. be like this fits in so nicely. You know, the lemon squares are a pie-like. Mm-hmm. And you and I were actually having a lemon conversation earlier this morning. Of course we were. But anyway, we have one of our absolute favorites uh, on the phone who's going to join in this conversation about hand pies and fried pies. And she is the uh, co-creator of Cooking and Coping along with you, Carol. And she is the star of Cooking and Coping. And her name is Leanne Galt. Good morning, Leanne. Morning, y'all. Well, you know, we when you talk about pies, you have to talk about fried pies and hand pies. And really, you know, the origin of those was, some say it was in the Cornish part, in Cornwall, that the miners would take hand, it, you know, a hand pie has to you know, fit in your hand, go in your work pail. It's not an open pie. It's an easy thing to, right. to carry around. Mm-hmm. And Leanne's hand pies that she tried look so good, they just jumped off the page in cooking and coping. So tell us about your first experience with hand pies. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, a few weeks ago, you made crawfish etouffee from the Mosquito Supper Club, and we were talking about crawfish pie, and we discussed making hand pies um because that little girl what's her name um melissa martin from um mosquito Mosquito supper Supper club Club in new orleans she takes her leftover um crawfish etouffee and makes hand pies and i made shrimp creole last week and i had a ton left over and i was like well surely you can make a shrimp creole hand pie so that's what i did wow was it a bit wet because Creole no, seems to really be a, a, a little more loose than etouffee in my sort of recollection there. It, it is. The Creole that I made, I made it with a roux, though, so it, ah. was, um, it was a little thicker. Gotcha. So, okay, Leanne, so when you did your, your crust, you just made a regular pie crust, right? Mm-hmm, I did. Um, flour and uh, butter, um, which I picked up from you, flour and butter and a little ice water. Yeah, okay, and you rolled, how big were your circles? Um, they were about five inches in di- diameter. They were kind of small. I would have made, I'll make them bigger next time, I think. Hmm. Okay, and but they were I, about five inches. Yeah, I love the picture of, of it, but yeah, they were, they were crimped. Did you put an, an egg wash or anything to hold them together while you were crimping? And what did, did you use to crimp the pie? I, I used an egg wash, uh, the like I don't know, a 
little rim around the inside of the pie, and I folded them over, and then I just used a fork to crimp them and then brushed the egg wash on top. So I have a question. Often when okay. you get a old-fashioned pie, I'll call it, it, uh, it has a sugar crust where it looks like sugar is just mm-hmm. dusted across it after it's been washed. It, is that how you create that, and do you do that on hand pies or fried pies? Um, yeah, mm-hmm. you can do that on fried pies. I mean, I think you do the sugar after you fry it, though, because it would burn probably. Mm-hmm. And on a hand pie, on, on a sweet pie, you can take especially turbinado sugar, mm-hmm. which is a little mm-hmm. grittier, works well. When you do your, you know, your egg wash like Leanne did on the top, you can sprinkle you know, sprinkle uh, terminado sugar. And I've also seen confectioner sugar used to put on top of a pie, like a fried pie maybe. No, you're shaking your head. No, now. I'm no, I'm just oh, I don't know why I'm shaking my head. It's just beautiful. In any time you have powdered sugar on, uh-huh. on top on of something, anything. That's just yeah. an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Come on in. It does, but Leanne. So you know, hand, they're you know baked hand pies, and then they're fried hand pies. And we have right. somebody that works here with us named Java. That's a big fried pie fan. Yeah, I I, I am, and it's all thanks to my uh, to my aunt Dilsey, uh, of uh, uh, in Oxford because it comes around every holiday season and i'm looking forward to it already yeah and, and we we generally use them um or i i mean i eat them anytime but they're usually like a breakfast type mm. of type of thing uh filled with uh peaches or filled with uh apples or you know some kind of uh sweet sweet filling well just remember that they were originally created to take to work so don't hesitate to bring <laughs> bring your uh, bring your bring your pie <laughs> Uh, but but and I think hand pies are probably um, in all cultures or in most of them. I mean, if you think about any kind of dumpling, um, Asian wise or like um, you know the spinach phyllo pies in Mediterranean, mm. yeah, abso- absolutely. But you know, in the in the South, we do have an obsession with sweet pies, and every oh, yeah. area of the country has its own special pie. I mean, huckleberry pie from the Pacific Northwest, mm-hmm. um, rhubarb pie from New England, blueberry pie from Maine. But nobody is uh, obsessed with pies as much as, as Southerners. And Jane and Michael Stern, who've done a wonderful series of books over the years on on the road through America, you know, that is their take is when they get south of the Mason-Dixon line, you know, they know they're in, in pie country. Yes. Yeah, and Carol. I will drive to Richland. There you go. Yeah, Richland's got a fried pie place, and I saw it the other day. Do Do you know much it's about so it? So good. Yes, it is. I mean, I don't know the people or anything, but um, I'm Tom's glad that my daughter is going to go back to yeah. Tom's I'm glad fried that my pies. Go back to Hattiesburg so I can stop again. I yes. can stop every week. Well, well so we're good. gonna we're gonna uh, make a. Uh, what do you call that? A field trip. Mm-hmm. You can get permission slips and go on a field trip from MPB to Tom's. But, you know, also, yeah. uh, a lot of people swear by the fried pies at Lindsay's in Oxford at the Chevron station. Hmm. Never had them, but I know Lindsay's. Delicious. Chicken on the stick, right? There's chicken famous on the stick for, famous, for but they are equally as famous for their, for their uh, fried pies. And, you know, I don't think it's fair, but Arkansas really claims... The fried pie. They are all in on the fried pie. I think there's a book. I don't of, support that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's that, Leanne? <laughs> I don't support that. No, you're, you're yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, but yeah, I think in the you know in the mountain south, which was really where the you know fried pie yeah. mm-hmm. hit its peak, but it's considered a cultural heirloom. Sure. There. Oh. Wow. Um, there's a little lady at the farmers market that. Jackson Farmer's Market on High Street. She has lovely apple and peach fried pies on Saturday. Yes. Now, no, there's I've had a those. hot tip. I've I, had didn't, those. I didn't I've know that. I've forgotten about those. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember her name, but those are really good. Yeah. Um, Isn't it the different. same lady that makes the pies, the cherry and blueberry pies and the cakes? Do I have the right I person? Um, this lady... Maybe, but at the farmer's market, the last few times I've been, she's only had fried pies in a little mm-hmm. glass case. 
Well, before we go off the air today, I really wanted to hit on chess pies. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and everybody can, you know, can jump in on this. But this is something I've started making a lot now that I'm living out in the country, way away from grocery stores, because all the ingredients are normally, you know, in your refrigerator, which is butter, mm-hmm. eggs, you know, buttermilk, a lemon, you know, flour. You can just mm-hmm. make it in... In no time, so um, I made. I've been making the one out of Edna Lewis's cookbook, oh. and it's it's absolutely yeah, delicious. But but the thing I wanted to tell you, Leanne, is she has some really important instructions on the bottom of the recipe, which I've I've never known this before. But she said it was really important for all the ingredients. Now I'm not talking about the crust, but the ingredients to be at room temperature because huh. in making a chess pie cold a cold ingredients like especially buttermilk or lemon juice will cause the butter to re-solidify uh-huh. so you know bring my eggs everything to room temperature and uh i know this probably sounds like i'm not a very smart person which but i'm always worried about things getting to room temperature like you're making something at the last minute says bring your eggs to room temperature well you just put it in warm water yeah oh. I, I think i have to sit the eggs out for you know an hour or so but just <laughs> put in a little, a little warm water and and go be for it. well you know at my house if i walk in the kitchen and i see two to four sticks of butter out on the uh counter I know, some, I know something yeah, great's no, about to happen. Happening. You know, and, yeah, and, does a little dance. and there's so there's so much there's a lot of uh controversy o- over how the chess pie got its name and there are probably ten different versions. But one was because it's in the you would put it in the pie chest. The chest, that's right. And people had pie safes and pie safe and the other one is like a woman made made a made the pie and the husband says wow what is this and she said it's just pie <laughs> <laughs> those are both great i that prefer great the second story. one you though. know i love food yeah. history <laughs> you know one of our uh, great listeners and callers kathleen from osaka just uh dropped a message on us and said that her favorite is custard pies and so what's the difference between a chess pie and a custard pie carol or leanne a custard pie is made more with a custard so it's um a thickened milk or cream yes yeah Uh, milk or or cream Mm -hmm. no buttermilk no lemons gotcha the lemon juice doesn't curdle the buttermilk in the chess pie I think how, how do you handle that? Buttermilk. Huh? You prefer it curdled? Per- now, no, it's I mean, it's already thing. curdled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in this case, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But how do, you, um, how do you get them to interact like that? Lemon and milk. Well, if you put lemon in milk, you're going to end up getting some kind of buttermilk. It's going to curdle, yeah. your, cur- curdle, yeah. curdle oh, well. your milk. Well, I know we're deep into the pie talk, and we only got about a minute left. <laughs> but I have to get this um, this email out of the way because Stephen, um, he was, you know, all into the uh, burger conversation. Ah, and the burger said, conversation. Where I grew up in Australia, um, he had the common toppings on a burger included a well-cooked fried egg, usually cooked in a ring, uh, fried onions, pickled beet slices, mm. along with lettuces oh. and, uh, and ketchup. So Oof. that was what Stephen was. I eating. was rolling with you to the ketchup. <laughs> well, I love a show where you start with burgers, go through pies, and end up in Australia. In Australia, get real hungry. Uh-huh. Le- uh, Leanne, you got a favorite burger? Um, the one I make at home. <laughs> Talk about it. Um, I do a smash burger. So, uh. um, yeah. So smash. Chuck. Tell us. Tell us go, about it. Tell our listeners how you smash a smash burger. <laughs> And you better hurry. Um, Chuck, and you roll it into the ball, salt and pepper the ball, get your skillet really hot, put the ball of meat in the skillet and smush it as hard as you can with a big spatula. And what a crispy, way to sign off. And craggy on the outside. It is delicious. And now I want one. 
Me too. Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. We are funded by generous contributions from good folks like you. Thanks. Our show is produced by Java Chapman for my co-host Carol Puckett. This is Malcolm White. If you would, please stay tuned now for Marshall Ramsey's show called Now You're Talking, followed immediately by Southern Remedy at 11. And you can join Carol and I next Monday and every Monday right here for more Deep South Dining Heard only on MPB Think Radio.